Good morning, everybody. I am giving this talk on behalf of the Mavis Air Adaptive Optics Module team. And I'm telling you something about the preliminary design, the trade-off which led to this design of the adaptive, opti adaptive optics module of Mavis. When I say Mavis AOM core team, I mean a list of people here. I just highlighted the PI, which is Francois, which cannot be here for some technical reasons. And uh, as you may see, most of the people in this list are in this room now, so it's maybe easier also for discussion or like uh, offline uh, questions and so on. Um, what's Mavis? Mavis is uh, the MCAO Assisted Visible Imager and Spectrograph. And uh, for MCAO, I mean, we aim to correct the 30 by 30 second field of view in the visible, so down to the visible, let's say, and to, fed, to feed an imager, and, uh, which will take advantage of the full field of view, and the spectrograph, which is now being selected to be a monolithic IFU with an image slicer. And the, the um, framework on which this is going to happen, hopefully, is the already existing adaptive optics facility at the VLT UT4 telescope, in which we already have a very good people sampling and corrective device, which is the deformable secondary mirror, and the four laser guide star facility, which is currently working. And this uh, facility is at the moment serving Muse, OK, and is going to serve, of course, Eris, hopefully next year. The feeling of the consortium of the PI and maybe also VISU in a sense was that the, the full potential of the adaptive optics facility was not exploited yet since uh, we still missed a um, full MCAO module and the, and the idea to push to the visible wave band was really attractive to, to everybody, of course. The um, Mavis itself, uh, as requested also by the TLR, is a, a modular instrument in which we have a, a main, an adaptive optics module. Here is the big one because the topic of the talk. And the two other modules, which are the two instruments, the, vis the imager and the spectrograph. And uh, also within the adaptive optics module, we decided to um, keep a modular approach. So we have sub-modules there, a post-focal relay, which uh, uh, re-images the focal planes uh, to uh, the NGS waveform sensor in the near infrared band, to the LGS waveform sensor, of course, uh, in the sodium line waveband. Then we have, uh, um, of course, the um, scientific focal plane, re imaged uh, into the direction of the instruments. And then uh, inside the uh, AOM, RTC and electronics are really keeping everything together, cannot be really allocated to one of the modules. They are all together. Is there a pointer somewhere? Meanwhile, I go on. So uh, each and every of these submodules can be divided into elements. I hear, oh, sorry, <laughs> so stupid. Okay, uh, in sub-elements, uh, I hear listed only the optomechanical parts, and I just mentioned the multiplicity, of both for the LGS and the uh, and, uh, NGS uh, sources. And uh, some of these elements uh, uh, really needed a, a, a trade-off so to select the best approach to be followed. While for the other ones, maybe they don't need a trade-off, but they are impacted by all these trade-offs going on. So what we decided to do for the first part of the phase A, now we, we are in the middle of the phase A more or less, was to run all these trade-offs in parallel together with simulations and also uh, development of the design of different modules. And now we have a baseline in which each of the parameter has, a, let's say, a preferred value. And we are going to rerun simulations with everything uh, together and to um, align also the, align the, um, the design of each of the modules so to match perfectly the interfaces. So the main trade-offs are listed in this, uh, in this slide. First one is the rotation scheme. Of course, we aim to compensate for natural guide star field of view, the rotation, and LGS star um, field of view rotation, which is differential with respect to the NGS and the, with respect to the scientific one. And here we had a discussion whether it was worth to split the AOM in two parts, one sitting in the Najmit on the Najmit platform and the other one attached to the adapter rotator, for example. This was similar to the Galaxy approach or some other um, possibility like uh, splitting before and after the NGS or the LGS and so on. That's a complicated trade-off. Another one is uh, the post-focal relay optical design. Here the main trade-off was between reflective and transmissive designs. 
Here, uh, of course, we had a look to the quality we could deliver at the focal plane, at the different focal planes, and onto the, um, on the DM, post-focal DMs, while reimagining the meta pupils, of course. But not only, we also considered some uh, other uh, inputs, like the flexibility of the design, since we had to adapt it to the rest of the trade-offs, the modularity, and also manufacturability, ease of alignment, uh, the possibility to have some uh, main planes, uh, I will speak about it after that, inside the design that could help the alignment itself, and so on. Another trade-off was about the DM configuration. So we had the simulations and the uh, sensitivity analysis made here in Archetri to select the best uh, number of uh, post-focal DMs. Uh, that was easy, <laughs> too. And uh, the best conjugation altitude and pitch. Now, after having this uh, trade-off made, there was a, an additional trade-off on the um, technology of the DM to be selected. This was led by Stefan Strebler at ESO, because ESO is procuring the, the DMs themselves. OK, then we have, uh, uh, for, concerning the LGS configuration, the number of laser guide stars which are needed to get the performance we want to have, and the asterism. This may be strange as a trade-off, since we know the AOF is providing four <laughs> laser guide stars. <laughs> but actually, there are ideas to, to, to overcome this <laughs> minor problem. And uh, there will be also a talk by Pierre tomorrow, I think, about the possibility to split uh, the light coming from the laser launchers. Uh, using an optical device. This has already been uh, uh, demonstrated and tried, let's say, on Sky. So we'll see something tomorrow, I hope. OK, uh, something else about the number of NGS to be used in the, in the analysis and then, of course, in the real instrument, uh, accessibility of the field of view. I mean, uh, do, do we want to split the field of view in parts, uh, each of them accessible to a different probe, or do we want to use the full field of view, which is, in the end, what we selected for each of them, and so on. And also the possibility to have the splitting of the near-infrared light before and after the um, post-focal uh, DMs. We we see that we can still gain something even if we are, we are optimizing for a smaller field of view, so we decided to split after. And then something more scientific and still, unfortunately, still ongoing. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, that's what's still there. All of these uh, trade-offs basically concur to the final performance on the instrument in terms of uh, uh, serration and also um, sky coverage, of course. And basically, uh, each of them is linked somehow to the design ongoing in different ways in a really complicated manner. It was difficult to decide to start from one thing and then following uh, a chain. So that's why we went all in parallel. And these are the results of the off. So now the design is made like this. We have for the focal relays um, a refractive design. So you see here light coming from the VLT. This is the uh, Nashmit uh, um, focal plane here. Sorry, I'm really shaking a lot. Uh, we are going to introduce here means uh, to uh, inject the light from a calibration unit. It's not shown here. We have uh, an atmospheric dispersion correction here, which is in a common path for the full wave band from 450 to uh, 1700 nanometers, so it's a really wide band. We have a common path key mirror here, the rotating the field for the natural guide star and uh, for the science path, the two DMs. Then um, they cry separating the near infrared light, which is going to the NGS reference sensor and the visible light, and again the notch filter to move, to put the the um, to select the, the sodium line to be sent to the LGS reference sensor and leave all the rest to the science path in which we have a, an F20 field of view at the end. Here a selector will allow to select between the imager, the spectrograph, and the visitor instrument. This design has been selected, as I mentioned before, so because it's uh, easier to, ad to be adapted to optimization of the altitude and size of the DMs and so on. Plus, uh, there, are these, uh, there is this intermediate focal plane here. There is a pupil plane in, inside the ADC, basically, in between the, the glasses here. And these are considered as uh, useful during the alignment uh, procedure. We have other instruments which lack this kind of stuff. OK, concerning the NGS reference sensor design, now the baseline is to have three natural guide stars. At, I mean, maximum three, <laughs> depending on the constellation, uh, and looked for them in a two art minute to the emitter field of view. This is unre unrestricted in the sense that each of them, each of the patrolling stages can move within the full field of view. And this is uh, allowed also by the fact that the, mm, the peak of mirrors are positioned on a different level so that they don't collide one to each other. On these uh, um, stages, we have the NGS detector doers 
which includes a baffling system for the uh, three-layer rejection, wave band filter to remove the very red part that we don't want to sense. And then something which is to us new, the idea to have a splitting system inside each of the dewer to put a, a small fraction of the light in, a, in the truth wave from sensing in this way, so that the idea is to have uh, the tip tilt image uh, in the center of the big detector. Here, this is a Safira one, using small number of pictures. Here is four by four, but it's not really optimized yet. And then uh, to uh, take 10% more or less of the light, probably from the bluer part, uh, and re-image two out of focus images to make some uh, um, <laughs> some way from sensing for the for the truth using. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> using fade diversity. Uh, these are arranged in this way so that the, uh, we can try and read in a non-destructive manner the detector because uh, these two loops will have a very different uh, um, frame rate, which is required. Okay, concerning the LGS weapon sensor design, this is the current uh, status. We aim to have uh, eight uh, laser guide star in a 17.5 arc second radius asterism. And uh, the wavelength sensor itself for each of the stars is a Shakarma with a 40 by 40 uh, subaperture sampling. And the, the, the module uh, includes means for field rotation to compensate the, the already the rotated field that we want to deliver to the science camera. And uh, uh, means for focusing of the, of the LGS wavelength sensor to the apparent location of the, of the star itself, which will change with the elevation of the telescope. Okay, now with all these assumptions, uh, we ran the simulations. These are these are the results of, um, okay, they've been done both with Fourier approximation and with end-to-end -end, um, full simulations. This has been run here in Archetri by Guido and the, the team here. So basically, using all these parameters list here, the main one we care about is, are of course, the, 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 the field of views and the, the kind of controller. The, the gain and the delay and so on, but of course all of them are uh, important. Now, recently also the, the profile of the sodium and the delegation has been included. So what we get here is basically that uh, within the science field of view, we are above uh, the bright end TLR we have by ESA, but we don't care only about this, of course. Uh, we are also interested in the sky coverage, that's the uh, big, uh, big challenge. So we want to see how, which, which kind of correction we can get also on the outer part of the field of view. And this big box here is basically the NGS with from sensor field of view. So what's happening here in the outer part? So uh, the thing is that, okay, sorry. From this one, you, you can see that in the near infrared, which is what we are interested in for the NGS with from sensing, this is really falling down fast. But this is the ratio, which is considered really not the best matrix for this kind of... Uh, of um, considerations, so uh, we looked also in, into some other metrics like encircled energy, which tell us how much uh, information we lose uh, while going outside and losing a correction, and even better, the full width of maximum, which gives us the real sensitivity because in the end we will lose the peak of the PSF. And so it's, it's being the smaller part, it's also more sensitive to tip tilt and so on. So here I plotted, I show the plot of the full width of maximum as a function of the distance. And you see that in the near infrared, we still are, we gain a lot and we still are within the two by two pixel, even if the field of view now is assumed to be four by four. Okay, the last part now is the sky coverage simulations. So basically um, the assumptions made are, I think the usual for sky coverage. So it has been considered a tomographic error depending on the off-axis jitter for a single star and the number of stars we, we think we can find. This statistics uh, is based on, based on some statistics. We have another one with, uh, based on Trilegal, uh, the are in line, of course, more or less. This is a work made by our colleagues in LAM. And uh, then wind check error has been added and the noise error depending, of course, on the magnitude of the star has been added. In this plot you see, which is the residual jitter you can expect for the the average distance of the stars you can find uh, as a function of the uh, integrated magnitude. And basically we see we are almost always within the 20 mass. And this leads to this sky coverage curve in which uh, we can see that that's the first one which has been pro provided, but I mean, uh, now we are going to check everything again from scratch, as I, as I said. 
that we can, uh, we aim to have this 50% uh, sky coverage, this is South Galactic Pole, uh, with a jitter always uh, about uh, 15 milliseconds. We have the same curve produced also by uh, Cedric here in, uh, in Arcetri, which is slightly more pessimistic, but it's still below the 20 mass. So, finally, something really preliminary. So we, work, we are working on the preliminary budget for the Wave from Terror, including, of course, uh, the, the main contribution, which is DAO. This is for the bright end. And some other contributions here. Just a couple of comments. One is, uh, as, as you see, the calibration residual here is almost always 100%, because we are using this as a, a buffer, as a contingency, because these terms are still missing, and I expect it not to be negligible. And uh, um, I, I will not go into all these details because the, the work is still in progress. <laughs> but we are really, uh, yeah, we, we will be forced to finish it in the next uh, three or four months because phase A is uh, finishing at the time. And that's it. I just want to thank everybody.